I wanted to give a message today that is more of a, as Matthew might say, a theological study. Now before you all go, <laughs> I want to make it interesting, hopefully to you, but I also want to make it informative because I haven't done this here, this church, uh, in quite this way. And even in, uh, no, I really didn't do this in uh, Fort Lauderdale either. But I want everyone to think about the Bible. We all know it. We all read it. That's hopeful. I'm hopeful that we do. But I'd like you to not only be able to read it and study it, but also be able to teach it. If somebody asks you a question about the Bible, do you say, well, here's my pastor's phone number? <laughs> Which you're free to do, but I would prefer that you be able to explain it. And that makes so much more impact. I don't know how many people have called me and told me they talked to somebody at work and they gave them my phone number. Didn't hear from them. Because that's another major step for people. Uh, they're afraid that I'll ask for their credit card number first, I guess. <laughs> but I would like us all to be proficient in being able to explain what we do, why we do it, and where we get it from. And so I think most of you do. That's why we have interactive Bible studies so we can share. That's what I look forward to next week in, in Matthew 21. Well, why would I pick those scriptures? 23 through 46. Well, read them and then we'll discuss about it next week because I find those intriguing. But if you just read over those, you might, oh, okay, what's special here? But dig in and study because that's, like that's what I'd like to do. So the title of my message today is 10 Words. Ten words. Do you know what that means? Say, say some. Ten words. Ten words. Say that again. Speak loud. Nine plus one. A math major, right here. I think he got his masters in mathematics. No, most people, if you talk or whatever you study, you'll find that ten words, the Jewish people or those who practice Judaism will say, oh, I know that. You're talking about the Ten Commandments. Because they refer to the Ten Commandments as the Ten Words. Love, adultery, murder, stealing, buying, those, they just refer to those commandments as ten words. Simplify it. And you can understand because they didn't have the written word for centuries, millennia. All they had was what they were told. What was read to them from scribes and and uh, uh, theologians at their time, and prophets, priests. So, I want to give you not anything about the Ten Commandments, but I want to, <coughs> excuse me, enhance your study, enhance your teachability. Is that a word? It is today. Omega One. Because I'd like you to have an understanding because we are to, we study the Bible, we go to the Feast of Tabernacles, we keep the Spring Holy Days, we know what the Bible says and we strive to do it. Live like Christ, right? So a lot of people, they don't study the Bible, they don't know, but they're all going to have questions. Maybe a mate, maybe a family member, maybe a coworker, whatever, friends. We should have some fundamentals because if they ask us, well, 
Where do you go every year? Ah, let me tell you about the Feast of Tabernacles. We can all do that, right? Well, there are other things, some fundamentals, that may help you to answer some questions or be able to bring something to them. I was a builder. He was a builder. David's done some building. You've done some building. We, I'm sure everybody's done a little building. But if you came to me and said, wow, I really like this gable roof. I go, it's a hip. It's a hip roof. Well, what if I didn't even know it was a hip roof? You'd look at me like, you're an idiot. You're supposed to know this stuff, and you don't. So, with us, we're trained to be the future world leaders. Uh, what does it call us? Priests and what? Kings and priests. And everything we're going to teach will be out of the same book. Everybody's judged by the same words. So, I'd like to, hopefully, you'll find this interesting. If not... Uh, we probably, the, you aren't going to pan them to see if they're asleep, right? <laughs> Not today. Not today. Well, I have a handout for you that I'd like, Mary, if you don't mind, if you could get you and Tracy to hand those out to everyone. They're in that folder there. So that way you have something to follow along so that you can even make notes. I wish you would make notes because we're going to talk about some things. It's going to even be some interaction going here, hopefully. Uh, and don't feel like, uh, well, I don't really know anything, so I'm not going to say anything. Um, because I think you'll find this to be very interesting and perhaps keep this so that you can refer back to it if somebody asks you a question. So... On this sheet, you have ten words. Five of Hebrew and five of Greek. Okay? Can anybody tell me about the very first word? And you, Yes, sir? I believe it's Hebrew from the beginning, right? Ah, Bereshit. Bereshit. Yes, it's sheet. It's sheet. Because you must remember that the Hebrew I is pronounced as an E in almost all cases. Okay? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Bereshit. And it is... What did you say it was? I thought it was beginning. Ah, very good. Bereshit is the he... Very good. Yes. That is the word for Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Okay? And Bereshit means, and they actually have more of a guttural sound. Everything that, the, that in Hebrew is so bech. You know, it's like you're trying to get something out of your throat. You know, it's not a pretty language. Hebrew is not a pretty language. No matter how you, how you cut it now, they, to them, they think it is, but it's not because in the original Hebrew, not the transliteration that we have today, but in biblical times, there were no vowels. They didn't have any vowels. Okay? I put vowels in this, like E, because that's what the transliteration, that's what they teach today. But when you go back to look at the original Bible, there wasn't any vowels. The I-O-U, A-E-I-O-U, was added later, after the captivity in Babylon. They kind of needed to, 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 you know, the Babylonians and then the Persians and everything. They kind of needed to, 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 to educate them a little bit better about their language because they didn't like that. Everything was Kirk. Was it influenced by the Greek at all? Oh, yes. It was, yes. As this began to take form, Hebrew was then kind of a adopting or adapting to whoever was in charge. Because they tried to fit in a little bit of what they needed to do. So, the, this is the word for Genesis. 
And the actual translation of this is in the beginning. So if you want to write that down. In the beginning. That's what Genesis in Hebrew means. So what is Genesis? Is Genesis a, a Latin word or a Greek word? We know it's in English. We use it in English. We, we did. Well, basically when the Septuagint was put together, they kind of adapted that. And then you had the English language. So it's, it's what they brought together to help us understand. Because we would say, if somebody had asked me before, well, what does Genesis mean? I'd say, starting or beginning or... Hmm? That's what most of us... But almost all Jews who truly follow will understand that this word was in the beginning. That's what they say. Now you would say, well, well, how do you get that just out of one word? Well, they do. Okay? Because the Hebrew language was formed from what? Do you know? Word pictures. Word pictures. So their consonants, their words, were formed from visual pictures. I, I give you an example. The first letter that they would talk about. Aleph. Aleph. Okay? This is what they had. This was their, it would look like this. Now, does that look like something? Now, you can kind of get it out here. Oh, you're getting into it. It means ox. Ox. Okay? That was one. And so the first letter, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ox, is where they get this. Now, they, because you have to, you have to truly read the old Hebrew, there was no vowels. So which vowel would you put in it? Depends on who's translated. Oh, now you can see some of the issues and why they had scribes and why they wanted this. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, they put this, this in instead of this one. So here was ah, ox. And it meant strength. Strength. Okay? So they would have this and they knew, well, it represented an ox. Or it could be an ox. Okay? So here they had a uh, ox, strength, and also leader. Leader. So these, this is how the words were actually, that language was uh, put together. Now, let me do one more before I bore you here. Let's see if I can get this right. Now that looks strange, but that's bet. BT. Hangman. Bet. Okay. <laughs> Hangman. Going to find this interesting because if you saw that symbol, it's going to mean house. House. This is the way, and if you go back to when they uncover houses, you would find back then they were built so you entered here and then this was the main thing and then the bedroom was kept by itself. Also referred to, interesting, this area here, you were to come in this way, you stayed here, you didn't go back into what they considered holy of holies. Hmm. Interesting, because that was a bedroom. That was well, they kept that way. Yes, sir. It's like Bethel, right? Bethel. Like house of God. House of Bethel. God. Beth. Yeah, yeah. Beth. Bethel. Yeah. So that's when you see BT, Beth. That's where it starts. Bethel. So that's what they were. Uh, that's how this language really began to take place. That's how you can understand it. Maybe in a, in a, in a better way. So y this would mean, what would it mean here? If you saw these one and then this one here. If you were to read that in Hebrew, ancient Hebrew, what would it mean? What? Say what? Strength or leader of the house? Strength of the house? Could be. 
Could be. But you see how you would know if you saw what the person was talking about as you picture this together. And the only thing you always have to remember about the Hebrew is what? It's read from right to left. Why would he do that? They're one of the few languages. There's hardly any language that does that. Say that? Well, you're closer than you think. Because 90% of the people, majority of the people were right-handed. And so they did not start writing. They had the thing would chisel. Chisel on stone is how the words of God were first put down. That's what, and so a chiseler, most people were right-handed. They didn't want to because, I mean, you chisel enough, you're going to hit this hand. And they didn't want to mess up. So you wanted your, your, your left hand that you didn't use as much to hold it and you chiseled out that. So that's exactly why it's from right to left. And when they started writing it on uh, cuneiform tablets and skins and everything else, they didn't want to start from left to right because that's not what was inscribed in stone. So it's been that way ever since this day. So, just thought I would give you that as a beginning. And one other thing I'd like to talk about before we go into the rest of the ten words or the nine other words is that there's so much difference between Hebrew and Greek. Worlds of difference. Because the Greeks were what? Anybody know what they're known for? Libraries, education. It was Alexander the Great that said, we're going to conquer all these, and the first thing we're going to do is set up libraries. We're going to educate them. Because they weren't intelligent enough. And the Greek language is far superior to anything else. And that's one of the reasons he wanted to conquer the world. When he would, he would go in and let them have their stuff, but then they would have to accept the Greek Libraries, the Greek teachings, you could have your own, but you had, to, you had to also read this. Okay? The Greek language is a language which everything makes sense. Okay? Your Greek writers in the New Testament did everything in chronological order. Luke. Luke the physician, right? He was Greek. He wrote, it's the only way we know what happened in the three and a half years of Christ was that he put it in chronological order. Now, some of John is, some of Matthew, some are, are somewhat, but no, they didn't, the Hebrews didn't write that way. Where the Greeks are like, oh no, it's like mathematics or whatever, it's, everything follows a line. No. The Hebrews didn't do that. So when you read from the Hebrew, whether it's Genesis, which is a great, it's, it's the best book to start with. Right? It is written as poetry. Okay? It's written as what's the most important thing? What's the most moving, emotional thing? Because that's signed as poetry. That's what they, how could we take these words and, and, and make it so that we can tell and people will be able to paint a picture with this. Back to this. This is how they were taught. This is what they kept. So uh, when you read it, not everything you would think, well, why didn't Moses write that? Uh, why didn't he put that in? Because he was following the Hebrew writing, which God inspired him to do because they were going to have the what? Christ said, the oracles of God. For the first 4,000 years, it was all about Hebrew. That's how God was revealed. So, I bring that out because if you look in the original Hebrew, the first words of the Bible is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? In Hebrew, take out some of the words because we filled in. We had to fill in. 
because it didn't make sense. And also, the Hebrew did not put spaces between any of the words. So, tell me that isn't difficult. So, you had no vowels, read it from right to left, and there was no break in between any of the words. Understand why it would take a scribe to try to then translate into another language what it would take? But in the original Hebrew, there were only seven words in the first verse of Genesis. If you read typical, it's 11, 10, 11, one may even put 12. There were only seven. Okay? In the second verse, in the original translation, there were 14 words. 7, 14, the completion of God as He was putting this together. The number of completion, what? 7, 14, so He even starts that way. Okay? Is anybody bored yet? No. Oh, okay. Okay. Because I'm ready to move on from as much technical. So we can go to this. The second word is what? Anybody want to try the second word? In the, okay, the first word, the second word is what? Shema. Now, there was no E, there was no O. So in the original relation, it was what? Shema. Shema. And you see that guttural quick. Shema. Shema. I mean, they just, because they didn't have vowels. Okay, so now to teach it better, it's better to put in vowels. That's, what, that's, that's why they came. So, what is... In Hebrew, what is the word for Shema? Exodus. Exodus. The second book of the Bible. It's Shema. The second book in the Bible. Whoops, there we go. I don't need it. I don't need it now. I've already given that. Okay. So, that's what Exodus is. Do you know what that word means? Shema. I always thought it meant exodus. It means leaving. You know, you exit somewhere. You see exit signs. Oh, okay. Here's what it means in Hebrew. These are the names. Shabbat. These are the names. <laughs> doesn't look like it doesn't. Let's look at the third word. The third word is, how do you pronounce it? Vaikra. Vaikra. You remember, because how it's spelled, the I's or E's. Vaikra. And what does that word mean? Leviticus. We had Genesis, we had Exodus, and now it's traced that we have Leviticus. Okay? What does that word mean? Vaikra. Say, oh. Calling out. Called by the Lord. That's what it means. You can write that down. Vaikra. Called by the Lord. <coughs> okay. So, let's go to the fourth one. Bamidba. Bamidba. As you can see, the vowels were added. And what? take a while to guess what that means. What is it? Numbers. Numbers. So, yep. So, what does that mean? Does it mean numbers? No. That's not what it means. The Hebrew will tell you. That word means in the wilderness. Write it down. In the wilderness. Okay, this is, this is, this is Hebrew. It's like, yeah, it's different. And then we have the fifth one, which Dale just said was what? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Devarim. 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 Yes. Well, that's what you would think it would mean, wouldn't it? And that's what I thought. But it isn't. No. It actually means with the word of Moses. With the word of Moses. Okay? Everybody have that written down? Now, does that all make sense? 
Now, look at the bottom of your page. This is what every Jew will know. These, they can tell you this exact sentence. What does it say, Bill? At the bottom of the page? In the beginning, these are the names of the Lord called in the wilderness by the words of Moses. Now you get it. The five books, the Torah. Why the Torah was so important? It's all about the Jews and Moses and God calling them. And that's why the Torah, the Pentateuch, was just so important. Because it? it was about them. Yes, sir? Is it, is it not the Jews, but it's all about Israel? Is that that? Yeah, that's true. But the Jews, this, this, this is the only way it's preserved is by the Jews. Because even God in His ultimate wisdom knew that Israel would be conquered and they disappeared, right? Yeah. Ten tribes, yeah, basically. They anyway. Huh? They didn't. They gave it up first. Right. But the Jews, He always kept a remnant here. So, there you have the first five words that I gave you here was made as a sentence and it was made so that these people could hold on to this understanding. So by saying these five words, they were actually making that statement. Statement of who they were. In the beginning, these are the names the Lord called in the wilderness by the words of Moses. Amazing five words. And they have their defining statement. <laughs> Their motto. This is what they believe. That's why Torah, the Torah was so important to them. Yes, sir? Isn't that why then they have a misunderstanding, of course, of who Jesus is? But they see yeah. Jesus as an apostle. <coughs> they see Him as overriding the law of Moses. Moses, yes. They kept bringing up the law of Moses all the time. Right. Not understanding that he is representing Moses, but they don't understand that. And then he's they're, they're going back to the old days and they can't get uh, past it. If you knew it, you would know he spoke of me. Because he talks about the prophet when he's talking. And even Abraham, before Abraham was, I am, was what Christ said. And they're going, what? What, <laughs> what are you talking about? Because he did meet Abraham as Melchizedek. So, here you have, to me, this incredible, incredible teaching. But I, I do need to tell you one thing that you'll, you'll read and you can't understand it. And I didn't, and I still don't know why. But the Hebrews, what did we say about their language? No consonants. I mean, I mean no vowels in the original. Right to left. Right. No split between words. They're just all put together. Almost as if this is a puzzle for anyone that came across it and tried to translate it. You couldn't do it unless you knew exactly what the main purpose of these were. So no one could hijack the Hebrew language. And there's one other thing they didn't do. There was no capitals. They would not capitalize one, one single word. Didn't matter what word that was. Nowhere was it capitalized. So it helped to keep it almost hidden. So you would, uh, wow, you would think, oh, you're going to talk about this. No. That's what they didn't do. So the amazing part was that when Alexander the Great conquered the Holy Land. And he had control of it. He didn't really, it wasn't until later, Tychus of Epiphanes had it. But whenever Alexander the Great wanted to take over, he, he was going to help the world to be educated. And everywhere he went, whether it was in India, Africa, wherever he conquered, he just kept coming across this book of five words and written in sometimes their own language but it went back to the same book it's as if that Torah was what went 
had gone all over the world except to one place. Greece. And so he said, everywhere I go, somebody has this teaching and the words are the same, no matter what it is about what law is and how things are done. So, he commissioned 70. Some say 72. 70 priests. Right, Matthew? Uh, I guess that's 70. So uh, what I, remember, I don't remember anything about it being out of the Yeah, it, this was attributed to him. Now, whether it, it was Greek or whatever, or was after him because it was 270, whatever. So, he, because he only lived 27 years. So, I mean, it's kind of like, did all this happen? But he was, he was given credit for this. Let's put it this way. This is what he wanted to do. So, they were carrying on. But, when, so he, he, grew, he got 70 rabbis together and brought them to Egypt and gave them a feast of feasts. All kinds of food. Brought them in and told them they, he wanted that translated into Greek. And so you had 70 or 72 that is argued about that. Supposedly one from each tribe. Don't know that at each of That's what they throw out there. Because they, uh, tribes were basically, most of them were lost at that time. Okay, so he gave it, and he said, you have 70 priests, I'm giving you 70 days to translate this into Greek. And they did. They translated the whole thing. So that everyone could check exactly what they, what they were writing. And later, he used them as they've said, the whole... Well, it's known as the Septuagint, which was the Old Testament in Greek. That wasn't done in 70 days. Because some of the writings weren't even brought out. But later they were told to do that. And that's where the Septuagint came from. Which, it, which was the actual Bible that Jesus Christ would have read from. That translation. Now, when he went up and read Isaiah from, in his own text, that would have been from the scrolls. That would have been... But most of the writings of the of the New Testament was by the Septuagint, as a Greek speaking version of the Bible. And if you go back and read it, it's amazing because you see the differences between the Septuagint and what we have today. Uh, the the differences will will you'll go wow that just explains it better, and others not as well. So I bring that up because now we're going to the second five words. Okay. Anybody know what the first word is? Matthew? How do you pronounce it, Matthew? How do you pronounce that word on the page? That's Matthias. Matthias, that was... Now, when you get to the Greek, here the I's are pronounced as I's. Not E's like it is in, Greek, like it is in Hebrew. Okay? So, Matthias... So what do you think that is I'm referencing there? That's what it means. But it's the first book of the New Testament, isn't it? So we saw the first five books of the Old Testament and we saw what we got from them. Now, what can we get from the first five books of the New Testament? Can anybody tell me what Matthias, she already said, what gift of Jehovah or gift of God is what it means. Why would this book be named? Do you think it just happened Matthew to be named Matthew? And so he was going to write the first book of the New Testament? What is a gift? What is the gift? Okay. Oh, he's the first one to introduced Jesus Christ who was a gift to the entire world. Yes. So here, that name actually means something. Because he introduced... Now, what was Matthew? Oh, a tax collector. The despised tax collector. Yes. Yes, I mean, they hated them. You know, we're not, uh, thankfully, we don't have any IRS agents in the room that I know of here, do we? Uh, oh, but 
they were even more despised than the IRS agents today. So, what did Matthew bring to the writings? So, because the, everything you have in your New Testament, every book, everything came from the Greek. It was originally all Greek. Do you know what Matthew was? He wrote it to the Jews so they could actually understand. What a gift that a Hebrew writer, not a Greek writer, a Hebrew writer would introduce the very first thing in the after three or four hundred years of being nothing. And then you have Christ show up on the scene, the Savior of the world is revealed by a Hebrew. A despised Hebrew at that. You find it to be amazing? I do. Because of the way it's put together. Second word, or number seven. You ought to be able to figure that one out. Marcos. Marcos. So if you go to Greece, you find a mark, you're going to call him Marcos. Right? What does Marcos' word mean? The second book of the New Testament. Means to dry out. To wring out. Have you ever had to wring out clothes because you got them too wet? Okay? You've been out in the rain and you wring the water out of it. That's what his, what his name means. Why would God give, inspire that to be done? Because it's the inspired Word of God. Right? And we have it and it's all over the world. What was unique about Marcus? In Greek. Didn't he get to the very basics? I mean, he didn't make a lot of just get to the point. Yes, he's very blunt in his thing. There is argument, great argument over whether Matthew was written first or Mark was written first. I'm sure Matthew back there knows that. It's a great argument. Eh, half one or the other. I'll go with Matthew just because it's in there. But Marcus wasn't with Jesus Christ as a disciple or an apostle. Was he, Kathy? No. So who was he? Who was this guy? Oh, very good. He was Peter's secretary or, or translator. The one who wrote things down. Why do you think Peter needed a translator? Jeannie, you know? Well, he was there in Hebrew. Uh, but at the time of Christ, at the time of all the disciples, the disciples typically did not speak in Hebrew or Greek. Aramaic. They spoke, very good, Aramaic, which is a derivative of Hebrew language. So many words go together and so forth. But it was a common language, uh, kind of brought on by the Greeks too. They had to find this thing. Okay, so why would Peter need somebody to write something down? Ah, uh, he couldn't write. He couldn't read. Many of the scholars will say he couldn't read or write. He didn't have to. Growing up, because he was called when he was what? He was already married. Right, Vic? He was already married. He had a fishing business. All he needed to know was fish. How much money? I got fish. How many count? This is how much money I get for that fish. So, it's easy to understand. He didn't. He couldn't read or write. Now, how did he quote Scripture? Because later on, after he had the Holy Spirit, you remember how he would just quote Scripture? Ah, oh, very good. His memory. Because Jews were actually trained from a very young age to memorize things. They didn't have books. Like they, nobody could afford books. They couldn't afford scrolls. They couldn't afford any of this stuff. So people would tell them and then they were growing up and Scripture was memorized. But also, he would now have the Holy Spirit. 
And so these things he would be able to recall and listen to them. So that's the great thing about Marcus. What do you think the next one is? Shouldn't be too hard. Number eight is who? Lucas. Lucas in Greek. What does the word Lucas mean? Anybody? Lucas means bringer of light. Bringer of light. Matter of fact, it even talks about being a, a bright one. Uh, even at its time, Lucas was Greek, wasn't he? Do you think he was educated? You're going to be in that society and be a doctor? You're going to be very well educated. You're going to be one of the, what? Bright ones. And talk about bringer, bringer of light. What's unique about his writing? Uh huh. Detail. Very good. And she, she said chronological order. Yes. True. That's what he did. But he wrote the first writings in Greek. He wrote to the Greeks. He wrote to Theophilus. Another Greek. So here, this amazing man, this physician, who decided to quit being a physician and be a what? A historian. Because he wasn't there when Christ did all this stuff. So what did he do? He went back 30 years later, 20 years later, and went and interviewed all the people who were there. That's what Luke's account is. So that's why you can see if you have a if you have a discrepancy between Matthew and Mark, uh, Matthew and Luke, I mean Matthew and John say one thing and Luke says another. What? How? How does that help you? Matthew was there, John was there, Luke was not there, but he was getting recollections from someone who was. And the beauty about Marcus writing for Peter, when you read that book, the study of it makes you realize that not everything was told. Peter didn't, Peter told the story, but he really didn't say he was the one that did this. He was the one that cut the guy's ear off. You know, so then someone cut his ear off. Well, Peter cut his ear off, but he's not mentioning it in Mark. And so some of these things, you that's why you cannot just read one book, oh, I've got this. But you read four different accounts. So, by the mouth of two or three witnesses is a matter established. God didn't give three, He gave four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John gave that to us. So us, so we would be able to read and we have the complete story. And when you see a little bit of a conflict, it's not a conflict because God inspires Scripture. There may be a mistranslation from something, but you just have to put the story together. And so people are going, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. That doesn't make sense because, because Matthew uh, brought this out at that time and, and, and that was at the end of his ministry and he's putting it... Well, that's not what Matthew's writings were about. What did I tell, about, what did I tell you about Hebrew writers? It was picture stories. It was word. It, it was putting things together so you would read it. So if Matthew, if you read Matthew, what what is the key part of Matthew to most people? It's the Sermon on the Mount. Where was the Sermon on the Mount given? On the Mount. Right? Just above, just above the Sea of Galilee where they actually take you. I guess some of you have been. You've been. So they'll take you and there's this little... It's not really a mountain. It's a, more of a hill. A rolling hill. So forth. Uh, uh, not as big as our trash dumps around here, right? No. Uh, but maybe a hundred foot uh, you know, crest or whatever. But that's where people sat. 
you know what's interesting is if you study where that was and here's the Sea of Galilee there was a main road going through here and that is one of the main travel roads for commerce and do you know who happened to have his tax collector thing right at that right at the foot of that Matthew well yeah was that when he heard that because you follow the scriptures he heard that amazing sermon because he was Jew he wouldn't have been working on Saturday okay they didn't collect on Saturday but would he have been there when that sermon was given because pretty soon you see that he's brought into the picture so was that a defining moment for him probably so probably so so you see some of his descriptions are not like Luke's. Luke was to go back as a historian for the Jews. Theophilus was a rich, Jew, uh, rich uh, Greek. He went back to tell the story in story form, flow, just like we would today. We wouldn't think about doing telling a story and then you know say, well, let me tell you about Jeannie. Well, she was born in you know 1922, and she. You know, uh, you know, you would tell we would we would tell this thing, where they wouldn't. They just say, oh, and then Jeannie did this and this, and may even tell the story. It's kind of like a Quentin Tarantino movie if you've ever seen it. He sometimes starts at the end, and then has the beginning, and then he has it all mixed up. That's how, that's how Jews told their stories. What was the most interesting story? What was the most poignant? point of the story rather than the chronological order okay so let me look at my watch out all right here we go so then so the ninth word is what how do you pronounce it there's a basketball player called the Greek freak anybody heard of him not what he watches basketball, NBA. I don't either, but he's a Greek freak. He's six foot eleven. Great player. His name is Giannis. Giannis, but it's spelled G I A N N I S. And it's pronounced Giannis. This word is spelled I mean it's spelled I O A N N E S. And it's Iwanis. Iwanis. What does Iwanis mean? John. Not even, you know, we don't, that doesn't even sound right, does it? I mean, Marcus sound like Marcus, Mark, and so forth. But, Iwanis. What does Iwanis mean? Ah, say that again. Gracious giver. What did John talk about the most? You know, the, the, huh? Love. He was the disciple that he's loved. Uh, the one that Jesus loved. And half of his book, half of the book of John, oh. cut it in half, is what? The last week of Jesus Christ's life. And the prayer. Oh! The high priestly prayer. That last night, everything about that was given for this reason. So, Gracious giver. And how many Johns were in the Bible? Two very important ones. John the Baptist, which was what? Who was he? He was a messenger. He was a messenger. Was he related to Christ? Yes. How about John? Was he related to Christ? Yes. Yes. So these, this is that direct tie to this gracious giver or as one translation puts it, God is gracious. What else was unique about John? Anybody? He was uh, the last one to die. The last one died, but he wasn't what? Uh, crucified. Wasn't martyred. You remember? And even, even Christ had to get on Peter because he goes, what about this one? talking to him about John. And he said, what's it to you, Peter? If he lives on. 
which he did. He lived on and was the last of the disciples, true disciples. And he was, because how many books did he write? How many did Matthew write? How many did Mark write? One. How many did Luke write? And how many did John write? Four. Finishes up. He's is twice as twice as many books. He did. He did. That's five. Yeah. Frank's wrong for a change. What's the date? Could everybody write this date down? Frank was wrong. Because he's hardly ever wrong about dates and things like that. So, yes. Okay, so last one. Acta. Acta. No, yeah, it's the book of Acts, right? Do you know what that word means? Anybody pull that one out? Go ahead. Say it again. I think you're right. A register of deeds. A register of deeds is what Acts means. Deeds of whom? The church. It's the beginning of the church and tells the very start of the church. Everything. So it's a register of all the acts. Say that again. A life and teaching. It introduces us to Paul, doesn't who wrote more books. Who wrote the book of Acts? Luke. And what's unique about the book of Acts compared to the book of Luke? First, second, and third hand. This book is written by Luke. Luke doesn't show up till I think it's chapter 16 or 17. But then he starts talking, maybe it's 18, but he starts talking about uh, from first person because he's there. So he went and, and collected all these stories, but after he gets into the book, he didn't have to because he was there. He went to prison and visited Paul. He went to all this stuff. So without him, would we have had anybody to write all that down and preserve it in Greek? No. No. So I didn't go into... In fact, this may be the only time I never gave a scripture in an entire part of a sermon. But I, I thought that this was important for you because it was important to me to understand these things so that now when I read the books, I don't look at them quite in the same way. And that if somebody asks, I can actually help them to understand. And now you can understand why the first five books are so close and personal to the Jews. And why most of their teachings are from the Torah. And they will mention the Torah more than either the writings and the uh, prophets and any of the others because they look at those five words that were described and that describes them and that is who they are because God called them and of course they lose the whole picture when it came, when it came to the New Testament because Christ gave them a chance and they turned their back on Christ as a whole and so that's why it was brought to the nations and all, even that wasn't done until he called the Apostle Paul. So, are there any questions? I have to look at my watch. Nobody has any questions. You know it all. <laughs> Was this profitable for you? I hope so. Frank said no. Okay, go ahead, Frank. Remind me of... Isn't there... Is there a sentence that can be formed in the name of the patriarch, Adam to Noah? Yes. Um, yes, yes. People have put that. It's can't say I would base any salvation or believe or whatever. But yes. I mean, because people have used, tried to find a different language in all, in every type of book and so forth. But yes, that, that's, that's, that's true too. But I find that this is 
this carries a lot of weight. And I thought it's important. So are we ever going to know the Bible inside and out? No. But when, one day we will. Because we will know, uh, what did you say? We will see him as he is and, and uh, be able to do that. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, I thought you were asking me oh, something. No, no, no. No. Yeah. We're going to know everything. Yes. But between now and then, there's one thing. If we know the first five books of the Old Testament and we study those, and we have the first five books and we know those, that's ten books. Ten books that we can know. Yes. Not clear now, but then. But then, yes. Yes. And when we understand the Messiah, and when we understand the writers of the first five books of the Bible, and then we understand that Moses, Moses didn't live through the 2,377 years that takes place between Genesis and Deuteronomy. He only lived 140 something years of that time. And so here, most of what is written of the Old Testament, 2,000 years before Moses was even born, God had to give that to him. Because Moses wrote those five books. So it helps us to understand, see God in the terms of, this is the way I want this book written. This is the way I want the five books written. So, alright? So, I'm done. Thank you for putting up with my zeal for this understanding. So now you'll never have to ask me or call me again.